Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for what is the latest in the Millenol Insight series online. My name's Mark Catchlove, and I lead the Millenol uh, Insight Group. And Millenol is the overall organization and consists of a family of brands. And you can see all those on the screen at the moment. We provide and design and provide furniture for uh, where people get healed, where people live where people learn and especially where people work. And today's talk will be focusing on where people work. And I'm pleased to say we have a specialist with us today, an experienced senior property workplace and facilities professional. I know that's true because that's what he wrote in his biography. So uh, Neil is known as an author, a blogger, but not just a person that shares his thoughts, he actually applies those thoughts in past projects and continues to do so. Looking forward to a great session. Use the chat box for questions and observations. Would be great to hear from you. Neil, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to be able to talk to you all this afternoon or this morning if you're, uh, if, if you're on the, uh, the other side of the world. Um, now, it's a slightly different title from the one you may have signed up to a little while ago. Um, Mark and I first discussed this session back in the autumn. Uh, we scheduled it for just before Christmas, but unfortunately, um, workload was just so great, I couldn't get the material together. But since then, I've thought of lots of other things. Uh, and in terms of just my own sort of meanderings and pondering within the industry, uh, what I read, and the client work that I do, um, I thought that perhaps today I needed to position things slightly differently. Um, I don't have a huge research team behind me. No one's preparing all my materials for me. This is me in a PowerPoint deck, and uh, and as I say, my sort of you know exposure to the the world of workplace during the during the normal course of of business. Um, so Mark gave a little introduction. Um, I have written and published three books so far. The fourth book, which I've written with my wife, is coming out this summer. Um, so watch this space for that one. Something completely unconnected, I think, with most of what I've written about before. So obviously well outside my comfort zone and slightly scary. Um, but um, I'll, be, I'll be sharing more information on that in due course. Um, I'm the Chief Workplace and Change Strategist at GoSpace AI. GoSpace is a, is a workspace scheduling tool, it takes you way beyond desk booking. If you have challenges with scheduling, if you want to get the right people together in the right space at the right time, then um, please connect with me and, and we can talk about what we can do. Um, I spend quite a bit of my time working in, in a sort of consulting advisory capacity with clients for everything from hybrid working programs, training leadership teams, right through to more traditional workplace creation type activity. Um, I recently had three projects go live. I'm now working on uh, with another client on a, on a more traditional workplace project as well. Um, so I do get to see the inside of quite a lot of organizations um, and think about work as well as as well as workplace. And if we sort of trace the, the progression really of these books and the thinking, which is where we'll, we'll lead to today, um, started with the workplace, then sort of worked a little bit further back in terms of some more fundamental um, considerations around change and around leadership. And then I took a, a further step back into the world of work itself with uh, with the third book. Um, if you if you joined today in the hope of, uh, you know, a, a lot of bad language, then sorry to disappoint you. This will all be completely, uh, uh, completely child friendly in terms of the delivery today. But just a little bit on the book, um, if you haven't uh, if you haven't had a look at it yet, um, what I do is I take all of these aspects of work uh, and look at a, a sort of you know a, a much travelled phrase in respect of each um, and dismantle it and then rebuild it. So I've taken on quite a lot in this book. Um, if you haven't um, decided to, to buy the book or have a look at it or borrow it yet, then I have been serialising it, albeit slowly, on my Medium site, uh, which is work essence I now post on Medium. Um, and I will continue to do so. So by the end of the year, the whole book will have been sort of re-edited and republished in a series of posts. Um, each one's probably about two thirds the length of the original and takes on board any sort of anything else I've thought of in the meantime. Um, because the difficulty with publishing a book is once you've published it, that's it. Um, unless the publisher decides to do a second edition, you're stuck with what you've said. Um, the world moves on. And uh, and so 
um, you know, serializing it gives me the opportunity to update it. So please, please look out for those. Um, very keen to, to discuss any of these issues as we go with you if, um, if they're of interest. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, a few reflections, if I may, first, I think it's important just to understand the context. Um, I don't think it's ever been as an exciting time as it is today in workplace. I think leading up to the pandemic before before this year, before the pandemic struck, leading up to sort of 2020, it's all getting a bit dull, really. Um, I think just about every workplace um, sort of strategy report was the same. You could do a find and replace. Um, if you look at the sorts of things we were talking about before our two year timeout, we were moving from traditional to agile and flexible spaces. We were really looking to, to boost the experience with amenities and services and a focus on employee and, and visitor well-being. Most of the technology we deployed up till that point was really focused on the building itself. We can really argue whether it was actually smart technology or not, or whether it was just sort of prompt and response technology. I would probably argue the latter. Um, but we were really focused on smart buildings, um, didn't really consider whether the occupants needed to be smart as long as the building was. Um, what we've been talking about since the pandemic, um, it's all along the same lines, but not quite the same, really. Obviously, hybrid has become, for most organisations, in one of its many forms, has become for, for office occupancy the sort of the, the chosen method. Um, we're really focused on employee choice, trying to make our workplaces into destinations, trying to create pull strategies rather than necessarily tell people when they ought to be in the office, encouraging people to, to want to come into these spaces. We've really sort of got to the stage where despite having sort of accepted the commute for many years, many decades in fact, and priced it in in terms of the the inconvenience, the time, the cost, uh, there's now very much a sort of anti-commute mindset within sort of the, the, the office environment where now we see it all as, a, as, a, as an, in, you know, as, as something that's almost an affront really is the fact that we actually ha might have to commute to an office. And with chat GPT and the hundreds of AI applications that are being launched almost every day at the moment, obviously artificial intelligence has become a real focus for us and the you know, I think at this stage we're still very much, in terms of general AI, scratching the surface, <clears throat> but certainly it's in everyone's sort of lexicon now and we're really focused on it. So in many ways we could probably actually sort of cut out that two-year detour and we could join the, join the highway. Because um, really, although we've accelerated through that little period of time, it, they are pretty much natural developments for the sorts of things we were talking about uh, a, a couple of years ago. Um, but I think it's safe to say that we are very much out of the pandemic era mindset approach and we're moving ahead again in, in ways that, uh, as I say, are, are interesting, exciting. Um, and, you know, rather than everything being a foregone conclusion, I think it's almost in a, we're in a situation now where there are very few conclusions, if any. But one of the things we haven't got away from is the fact that I would argue that we are still very much facing a whole system problem and some of the changes that we've seen are taking some time to, to wash through. But the interconnectedness of the way we live, work, how we travel, transport infrastructure and systems, how we choose to, to shop, um, how we source everything we need and then how we're entertained and we relax, they are all interlinked, they're all related. Um, and we're seeing, particularly in the city centres, some fairly serious ramifications of the move to hybrid working, both in our transport systems and in, in supporting those industries that are really geared around um, providing for us and entertaining us. We've seen a lot of people move away from cities during the pandemic. Um, you know, if you've ever lived in the countryside, I'm sure you'll be wanting to come back to the city anytime soon. But um, realistically, we've seen also organisations sourcing talent from, from well outside of their the more traditional or pre-pandemic scope. Um, so I, I would argue that most organisations now, their employees are far more dispersed than they ever were pre-pandemic. And we are seeing this in terms of the corporate real estate world, in terms of um, the property industry. Uh, with a number of um, sort of very high profile organizations saying that they are not renewing leases, that they're moving out of large city center offices. Um, and we're starting to see the impact of that on the actual sort of real estate market. And as I say, these, these things are gonna take a little while to come through. It didn't, it wasn't all apparent to us at the end of the pandemic. 
So this whole system problem is likely to be with us for, for quite some time. Um, and the solutions to a lot of this are, are still very much unknown. But I think not only is it an interesting and fascinating and exciting time to be in workplace, when we put workplace in the context of all of the urban and extra urban challenges we face, um, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's never been as exciting a time and, and as daunting a time, perhaps, in, in, in the broader field as it has ever been today. Now, one of the things that we uh, hear a lot about is ESG. Um, I'm not a fan of ESG, and I'm not a fan of ESG in relation to the way we, 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 we face it within workplace. It's quite vogue, even though the, the sort of the, the approach itself, um, you know, the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, which has been around for about 15 years in terms of organizations trying to position themselves um, in a positive light um, in order to attract investment and to be, to be taken uh, you know, seriously. Um, it's almost like the sort of the, the updated version of shareholder value, and we know where that got us. Um, I read recently a um, really interesting article where, where someone said, if we start to frame all of these challenges in, in, terms of, um, in terms of sort of shareholder value and in terms of investment and banking, then, then effectively, you know, we're, we're sort of recreating the, the, the situation that got us into the, created this problem in the first place. Um, so I would urge that we don't use that sort of terminology because in workplace, let's face it as well, we talk a lot about the environment, even though we don't necessarily understand what we're talking about a lot of the time. We kind of bumble our way through social because we're not really sure what that means and we never talk about governance because it doesn't seem to have any relevance to the way that we operate. So I've updated what was originally known as the three pillar model. Um, I didn't like the way it was represented as three pillars because it almost assumed that you could remove a whole pillar and the structure would continue to stand. And I don't think that is the case. And the interesting thing about triangles, and if you've seen me present before, um, you'll know that I'm quite interested in presenting information in triangles because I think what it emphasizes is that where we focus on one of these three points, we very often are likely to face challenges or negatively impact um, what's going on in one or both of the others. So post-pandemic, there was a huge focus on human sustainability. Because the pandemic affected us as human beings, affected us personally and our families and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the way we, we related to one another, we've really become focused on choice, on well-being, on sort of you know, and creating, maintaining and enhancing relationships on equality, diversity, inclusivity, the way we learn, develop and grow in our, in our careers and in our personal lives. So it's really all been about us because the pandemic affected us so badly. Um, but actually what we find is that if we're in focusing on human sustainability, we are challenging organizational and environmental sustainability. In particular, in workplace terms, we're creating large amounts potentially of unused space. An organization has to pay for that. They have to be responsible. Um, they have to be ethical. Um, so an organization carrying large amount of empty space in order to satisfy um, employee choice is not going to be sustainable. Nor it is environmentally. If we're producing emissions from that empty space, if we're heating it, lighting it, running services to it, consuming scarce resources in the process of maintaining empty space, that's far more serious than issues such as single-use plastics, for, ex for example, or the things that were, are tangible to us. And the other interesting thing about the triangle is we can actually look at what happens when we sort of combine any, any, any two of the three elements as well. So if we combine human and organization, we create an equitable situation. If we combine the environmental with the organization, it becomes viable. And with the human and the environmental, it becomes a position of responsibility. So actually, the sustainability triangle, I think, is a much more usable, much more balanced, much more, um, you know, easy to articulate way of looking at what we have come to know as ESG. Um, so if you hear me dissing ESG in the future, I'm not doing it just to be a, a troublemaker. I'm doing it because I think I've got something that I think um, relates to us in a, in a much better way, perhaps, than the tool we've, we've, we've come to use. The other sort of aspect of all of this that I've started playing with, and this is a fairly early stage, is, is that we can actually start to plot all of the accreditation schemes that we, we commonly use onto the triangle. Um, I've tried with a few here. It's by no means comprehensive. I do need a little bit of help with it because, first of all, I don't know all of the accreditation schemes that are out there. 
I'm not sure if they're sort of in exactly the right place on all of this, but what it does reinforce as well is that there's quite a bit of balance, really, in terms of the sorts of schemes that organisations will consider and sign up to and attempt to be certified in, in both the way they operate as organisations um, and the way their workplaces operate. So we can start to enrich this sustainability triangle. So as you can see with this, it becomes a much more usable tool for us than thinking about ESG. One of the other things we've really struggled to, to get to grips with, if anybody has solved this outside of any sort of push strategies like mandates or diktats or direction, uh, very interested to talk to you about it, but I haven't seen anybody solve this, um, which is that, um, and I'll come on to explain exactly why I think this situation has arisen, but when we think about this in the sort of two remarkably similar normal distributions here, um, in terms of our preferred number of days in the office being around about sort of two or three, and then those days generally being in the middle of the week because we prefer to be working at home or close to home on those days that are attached to the weekend. Um, we start to create what I've called the post-pandemic pinch. Um, and you know, this really does challenge our um, sustainability in terms of environment because we're support outside of the peak hours. Uh, we're supporting large amounts of underutilized and sometimes even unused space. Um, it challenges organizationally because in sustainability terms, because we have to sort of fund and pay for this, this time when the space is not being utilized. If you think with 168 available hours during the course of a week, if you look at relatively sort of average levels of utilization during a normal business day, and you look at this, uh, this sort of pattern of usage, then we're getting about 10 to 13% beneficial use out of our corporate real estate, which is not sustainable on, on in even the medium, let alone the long term. But it's also negative in terms of human sustainability. If we keep turning up to empty space, the people we need to see aren't there. If we, you know, if we, if, if while we're looking at creating a positive experience from the facilities that we create and we build and we furnish, that's fine, but actually if we're, if we're not getting a positive experience because the people aren't there and there's no energy and there's no life in those spaces, then also it's impacting human sustainability as well. So we're stuck with this hybrid reality, this unsolved problem, this post-pandemic pinch. And the last point I'll make before I sort of unpack all this and, and explain why I'm, I'm tabling these ideas is uh, what I've sort of called here the collaboration mystery. Um, what I'm going to argue is that most of what we see when we see people interacting, working together is not collaboration. We call it collaboration because it's a convenience. But this particular model I first came across probably somewhere in the region about 15 years ago, um, which was published by the Economist Intelligence Unit. And it was rather buried in a, an interesting but sort of lengthy report. But it was a real penny drop moment for me. So coordination, which is just organizing ourselves, um, to get together with the right people to do the things, to, to review what we've done and to plan what we're going to do next, and then cooperating and actually doing it. We're doing it with people that we know because we have to do it. We're not doing it because we want to do it, and we're not exploring anything new. That's when we're in the, the realms of collaboration. So please bear this in mind in terms of what I'm about to introduce, because collaboration is special. It's not something that happens um, intentionally, and it's not something that happens by design. Collaboration is something that happens accidentally. Um, but what I'm going to come on to explain is that all working together and all work is not the same. So just uh, a quote here. Um, I've always advocated in certainly all of my advisory work that we need to get as far upstream as possible when we're looking at a workplace. We don't start with the workplace. We end with the workplace. We start with um, the, the whole source of, of an organization, its mission, its purpose, its values. We start with then, we start to then think about the nature of the, uh, the work we'll do within that organization. And it's quite late in the consideration that we'll look at where we do it and, and in what physical spaces we'll do it. But I think where we've come to since the pandemic is we need to sort of expand this a little bit and we need to add the work in and we need to think that work is the driver for workplace. Workplaces don't exist without the need to support work. They don't exist in their own right. They never should exist in their own right. They are a response. It's an asset that we 
procure and we develop and we make available to our colleagues because it's serving a purpose which relates to work. So I think what we have to start understanding is what is the work that our workplaces are supporting? Now, the main contention of this presentation is that all work is not the same, that there are two very broad but very different types of work. So I'm going to start with alpha work, which is the work we know and understand. Now, if you're just starting your day in, in the US or in Canada or in Latin America, then you've probably got a list of things that you want to do today, whether that's an actual, actual list or whether it's just a series of things in your mind. <clears throat> you'll be thinking about what it is you want to do today, what it is you've got to do. There's a need for what you've got to do today, um, whether that's a need that's been identified by yourself or others. There is a driver for it, which is that it needs to be done. And you're going to potentially work within teams with people you already know to coordinate and cooperate on delivering what is needed. And the outcome is going to be fairly well known. You're probably going to do this work quite quickly. There is a pace associated with alpha work because there's usually a time parameter associated with it. Um, and we know what we're going to get. You know, there's a fairly predictable outcome from, from the work we're about to, to get involved in. Now, some of this work might be some minor process improvements, but it's generally within the context of what we've been asked or we've been told to do. Um, all of the interactions we'll have get planned. You know, there's sort of the extension really of what we encountered during the pandemic, where our diary just sort of seemed to fill up every day in a series of 30 minute or 60 minute slots. And we were always really glad of when there was a when there was a gap until someone said, I can see there's a gap in your diary. Perhaps we ought to have a meeting then. And we were rather tyrannized in, in that fashion because we were we were working to to, to uh, working on known activities with a with a predictable outcome. And we knew we had to fill our time to deliver it. Um, what I should say as well here is that most of alpha work has a very high potential for automation. We mentioned artificial intelligence earlier. We're starting to see AI encroach on tasks that we haven't seen prior to the pandemic. We thought sort of, you know, automation was starting to plateau in terms of what we would anticipate um, technology being able to replace in terms of human activity. <clears throat> but the net result during the pandemic was that we proved that for most people, for most of the time, alpha work could be performed remotely, could be performed at home. Or, or locally, it didn't need to be performed in an office. Yet quite interestingly, we still design our offices and use the language of alpha work in office design. So we still talk about primary and secondary work settings, primary being the spaces for alpha work. So if you're working on a workplace project now, I would be fairly certain that you're using the term primary to refer to desks uh, and very similar settings to desks because we're still stuck in this mode where we think about work as being alpha work. After all, it's what we've been recruited for. When someone designed a job role, they based it on alpha work. They based it on responding to a need with some known outcomes. It's what we get appraised on. It's what we get promoted on or possibly even exited on if we're not doing it very well or it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be needed anymore. So effectively, Alpha work is the work we know and understand. We do it, we prioritize it, we think about it, and we think about work in these terms. Um, so when we think about it in terms of presence in an office, this is why many organizations who are saying, we'd like to see our people two or three days a week are only seeing people for one or two days a week, if that. I've worked with three clients in the last six months or so who have a whole cohort of people supposedly working from the offices that I was engaged to, to, to transform um, who they never see at all. So we're actually experiencing some, some complete absence from the office because people feel quite comfortable about performing alpha work in other locations. And then there's the other type of work. Um, this is beta work. It's the work we don't really understand much about, in my view. Um, the driver for this is curiosity. Nobody's told us that it's needed. Nobody has even suggested that it's needed. We might have some idle thoughts about, well, we're supposing, if only, you know, we'll find ourselves using these types of expressions. Um, because this sort of activity requires an idea and then it requires the exploration of, of uh, you know, those people who might be similarly curious or similarly interested with us 
um, in developing this idea and making this idea into something because we think there's something behind it. This is when we get into collaboration. I mentioned the difference between collaboration, cooperation, and coordination earlier. This is, the, this is where collaboration occurs. It's, it's people who are not within the same teams. The outcome is entirely uncertain. A lot of the time with beta work, it won't produce anything at all. We might just be laying some seeds. We might just be you know, potentially putting down some markers that we may or may not come back to in the future. It's actually quite risky, it's quite exciting in comparison to alpha work, which is very solid and certain. We've got a lot of confidence that something's going to result. Um, but beta work, you know, anything can happen, and very often nothing happens. But I would argue that a lot of beta work requires face-to-face -face presence. Now, whether that's in the office or not, we will come on to, but it requires face-to-face -face presence because very often we're working with people that we haven't really worked with in the past, and so we need to start building trust. And trust, despite the common myth, does not happen at the coffee machine or the water cooler the first time you bump into someone. It takes some time to build. We may take that away and we may have online interactions with those people in terms of building that trust, but in the early stages it absolutely requires face-to-face -face interaction. We need to be in the presence and in the company of others. And sometimes it's actually the meeting of other people that stimulates the curiosity in the first place. We don't always do this intentionally. We don't always set out with, with some curiosity to say, I've got to find the people that might believe in this or think this is also interesting. It might be that a, a, a chance conversation with someone stimulates the curiosity, which then becomes shared. But we're not about, if we've had a fantastic idea, to put it on the table immediately with someone we've just met because we don't know what they're going to do with it or what they might do with it with, without us being involved in that. So we we'll always have a healthy scepticism that requires that we build that trust in the first place. It's very slow. It's very inefficient. It often involves quite a lot of dwelling and dawdling and all the sorts of things that are actually counter to the way we think about and describe alpha work. In many ways, they're almost sort of, you know, almost sort of dirty words when it, when we think about alpha work, you know, you dawdling and dwelling, we've got things to do, we've got to get on with it, you know, we can't, can't we just have a general chit chat about nothing and seeing what happens? Who does that? Who writes that into a job role? What we start to find is that organisations, if they don't have this language and they don't understand the difference between alpha and beta work, then they don't recognise beta work occurring and they don't recognise when it's actually occurred. So we'll come on to that in just a moment. But I would also add that um, I do believe that in many instances, actually, um, beta work has a much lower chance of being automated at this stage than alpha work, because we don't even know what it is. We can't write an algorithm for something if we don't know what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and so consequently, there is, a, there is a sort of very human nature and a very human context to beta work. It really does come from us being curious creatures. But what I should say, and I think it's really important to note, is that neither alpha or beta work are superior to the other. They are both just as important to us as individuals and to organisations. There have been many classic cases of organisational failure where beta work has not occurred where they thought in relation to their markets, their customers, their competition, that they've been doing incredibly well, but they just haven't. And, and it's only recognized and identified when it's too late. So everything we do in alpha work terms today is the beta work of yesterday. All the processes, the technologies, the methods, everything we apply in our work today, someone innovated that prior to us being involved in it. We may tinker with it and we may gradually improve it over time, but effectively everything today is yesterday's innovation. All alpha work today is, is yesterday's beta work. So they are incredibly vital, both in terms of uh, their importance within an organization and the fact that they occur. Um, so the last point to note on the difference between alpha and beta work that is also extremely important is that eventually all beta work becomes alpha work. As our idea becomes, um, starts to take some shape and some form and then starts to become shared and appears within an organization and is recognized with any luck as, a, as something worth pursuing and resources are attached to it, we then start to define known outcomes. 
we then start to move our beta work into alpha work and it takes over as alpha work and it then helps us drive the alpha work of today and the alpha work of tomorrow. So beta work doesn't stay beta work forever. And that's a really important consideration in understanding the difference between the two and their relationship. So we start to create a paradox of presence. And this is the problem that I think at the heart of it all in terms of thinking about work and the workplace we need to fix. So organizations are fundamentally designed for alpha work. And so they search for and they recruit and they bring into the organization, whether as employees or partners, they bring those in who can help deliver alpha work. And this is the diagram here of what happened up to and for the first part and most part of the pandemic. Um, what happened is the alpha work was, you know, took place, particularly pre-pandemic, inside the workplace, inside the office. And so offices were designed for alpha work. And as I say, we still use the language of alpha work when we talk about primary and secondary settings, primary and secondary work. Um, so we are still designing workplaces for alpha work prim primarily. But as a matter of luck rather than strategy, because most organizations have got no idea how innovation occurs within them other than the large you know, and super large organizations who are lucky enough to be able to have an innovation department or team. Effectively, there was enough idea generation and, and beta work occurring because people were present. It was the fact that people were in the same space to complete their alpha work, um, you know, trying to avoid disturbance, headphones on, beavering away at the desk, doing all the sorts of things, you know, all the sorts of considerations that within the workplace industry we were focused on, like noise and disturbance and and acoustics and, you know, and, and some of the aspects of sort of visual workplace design. But effectively, there was enough opportunity for beta work to take place um, prior to the pandemic for, for most organizations to be able to, to, to innovate and to be productive. But then during the pandemic, we started to realize that if alpha work can be mostly done anywhere, then we can start to a huge degree to skip the process where people come into the office and are, and are present together. And if alpha work is mainly being performed at home, where are those encounters and where is that trust building occurring that will lead to beta work? And the argument here is that it, during the pandemic, to a huge extent, wasn't happening. Um, and what I certainly saw with the clients I was working with during the pandemic was a very low level, if not complete absence of inter-team working. Inter-team relationships are just as important as, as relationships within teams. Um, they may not even be inter-team. They may literally just be individuals from different parts of the business who needing to work with individuals from other parts of the business, not within their own team. So during the pandemic, we got very good at organizing ourselves. We got really good at organizing our team-based activity. We have our regular team meetings and we'd all develop those relationships, um, build on those relationships. We probably spent more time together within our teams during the pandemic than we had pre-pandemic, but we spent far less with other people from within the organization and with other teams. So all of this was going on during the pandemic. And then what are we facing today? So what we've actually got today um, is the situation and the reason for the paradox is that we need to be present enough doing alpha work so that we can do beta work because we don't design workplaces for beta work we design workplaces for alpha work and even all of those settings that we put in that we think are for collaboration are actually for coordination and cooperation they are not collaborative settings they are just work settings where we can take our alpha work to work with people that we already know in a space where we know what we need to get done or we're planning what we need to do. So essentially, um, the paradox we're, we're facing means that we, we have to try and solve this issue of some people working at home delivering their alpha work, but having enough people in the workplace doing alpha work that beta work will result. Or alternatively, and this is what I'll come on to, or alternatively, what we have to do is understand how we bring people into a workplace with a focus on beta work and not a focus on alpha work. And as I say, creating settings that we consider to be collaborative settings is not the way to do this. That's not what's going to bring people into the workplace to work together. Other than if they know each other and they know what they need to do. So this paradox is something that we haven't solved.
This is still a very real problem in workplace thinking, and I think that it's all driven by this understanding of the different types of work. And I think any understanding that we feel we've had of the different types of work to date has not been correct. So we need to rebalance work and we need to rebalance the workplace. So to talk about rebalancing work, that's not just for, for certain teams or certain individuals, this is for everyone. And I know a lot of roles will be focused on process or have very clear instructions on what they need to accomplish. And we say, well, look, not everyone can be doing beta work, but sometimes beta work is small scale. It might just be a, a, a really useful and interesting workaround in a process that, that sort of changes the way that people work. So there's a lot of insight in, in, you know, within, within any team and within any organization that we need to tap into. So beta work is possible for everyone. It doesn't have to be big blue sky thinking at a big, quite small scale. But if we think about sort of what these characteristics on the left-hand side of alpha work are with the characteristics of beta work, they, they are related. But what's really vitally important and something that really has been a huge penny drop moment since Christmas for me personally, is that most team leaders and team managers um, you know, if you if you read social channels, you believe that they're all just control freaks who just want everybody to be in so they can see them to make sure they're working. Actually, most team leaders and team managers that I talk to have an instinctive feeling that somehow their people being together is is beneficial, not just for the team, but for the organization as well and for the individuals within it. But they can't articulate it. They don't have an awareness of the of the different types of work, of the language to be able to talk about that benefit. And, and to be able to express it in the right way. So the first challenge for us in rebalancing work is awareness. It's to give team leaders and team managers the vocabulary they need um, and to give them the, the, the understanding they need to talk about the different types of work. We need to start having a different conversation in the workplace about work itself, right back to the very source. We're not talking about the workplace at the moment, we're just talking about what it is that people do. And to take a couple of examples here, with, with alpha work, we have clearly established relationships, but in the very early stages of beta work, it's about connections. They haven't yet fully formed into relationships. They are just connections. We're exploring. We're just searching out what might be possible, what might be interesting for us. And, and we, might be, we might be sought out by others as well in terms of, you know, potentially we have a, we have a role to play with others. Um, in terms of ideas, yes, ideas are developed within beta work, but they become sort of, you know, small incremental improvements by the time they're, they're sort of lodged into our alpha work processes. Alpha work is really fixated on efficiency, making sure that we can do the, the you know, create the maximum amount of pro productivity with the minimum consumption of resources or time or investment. But actually, beta work is really all about inquiry rather than efficiency. It's slower, less efficient, takes a long time. I won't go through all of these, and I urge you to have a think about them, but we need to give leaders and managers the vocabulary they need to be able to understand what it is they have to do for their people and how they can potentially ensure that, um, that their team members and their, their direct reports understand what's really going on in terms of work and understand that and, and also to, for, for those team leaders and managers to recognize the contribution that beta work is making. So recognition is a huge factor in all of this, as is reward. If we're going to be encouraging and stimulating beta work, we have to know that it's happening and we have to reward it when it's successful, but we also have to reward it when it's successful in terms of trying. You know, the whole idea of fail fast, fail often. This is where it really comes into play. This is where team leaders and team managers have to understand that if they see beta work occurring, they have to have an appreciation and understanding that it's not always going to be successful and it's not all going to lead to something. But if they're not doing it, then it is as sure as hell going to lead to absolutely nothing at all. So it has to be recognized and it has to be rewarded. And this is all part of the process of rebalancing work. And then we have to rebalance the physical workplace. And the way that I like to describe this is fast lane, slow lane. So if we think about what's when we wake up in the morning, if we think about our sort of instinctive thoughts about where we're going to work today, 
If we think about what's, what we expect to be provided in most modern workplaces, we want connectivity, we want work settings, we want amenities, and we want services, and we want a combination of all of those. We want them to be working all of the time. We want them to be of high quality. We expect them to be there. This is no longer optional. This is an expectation. It doesn't have to be a workplace that a fortune has been spent on. It just has to be suitable, sufficient, appropriate to what it is our organisation does and we do. But is it going to make us, when we get out of bed in the morning, want to be in the workplace? I want to be in the workplace. I'm, I'm just going to go to that place because it's got this fantastic balance of work settings that supports everything I need to do. You know, am I going to am I going to spend thirty pounds on a commute because I can get a fantastic barista to serve coffee? Probably not. You know, connectivity is quite likely that my connectivity at home is just as good as in the office, or it might not be just as good, but it's not noticeably worse than being in the office. And very often these days, and I still see it, it's better at home than it is in the office. Um, and in terms of services, well, most of those services we only need because we're in the office rather than need them at home. So it's not going to get, they're not part of a pull strategy. They're not going to be the draw that brings us into the office. But when we're there, we expect them, expect them to be working, expect them to be high quality. They're in our fast lane. And I think when we think about coffee, it's a really good, it's a really good sort of point to pull out here in terms of describing the difference between fast lane and slow lane. In the fast lane, we expect the coffee machine to be good quality coffee, but we expect to push a button and out it comes and we can go off and do what we need to do. A little while ago, I used to listen to descriptions of um, sort of apps that potentially when you walk through the door would actually notify the barista that you'd arrived. And the barista knew that you always like to have a caramel latte. Why on earth? I don't know. But I like to have a caramel latte when you when you walk through the door. And so there it was waiting for you. And it was like running in a marathon where you ran past the water table and picked up your water, picked up your coffee and off you went to do your stuff. That's super fast lane provision. And that became a driver in terms of workplace design. And if you think about some of the projects you may have been involved in or some of the workplaces you've seen, it's just, you know, make sure the service is as fast and as crisp and as clean as possible. Um, but actually, supposing you got to the machine and you had to, like, take out the empty the grouts and put the brown beans in and press the button and froth your own milk and, and it took a while to do it. And there might be a queue and you might be watching someone in front of you making a really terrible cappuccino and, and talk to them about making a better cappuccino because you've done it before and they haven't. But you're going to have a conversation and it's slow lane. And, you know, there are organizations in the past and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, but they deliberately engineered queues in their restaurants because they wanted people to speak to one another. There was a lot in that. That was slow lane thinking. But in rebalancing the workplace, the balance we're trying to achieve is the balance between slow lane and fast lane. We have to provide both. In exactly the same way as alpha and beta work, neither is more important than the other. Fast lane and slow lane are just as important as one another in our physical workplace. And the fast lane really is servicing alpha work and the slow lane is servicing beta work. But when we think about slow lane, it is not those settings, as I've described, that we think of as collaborative settings. These are social spaces. In many ways, we have to go above and beyond in actually making it, making it clear that these are not workspaces. Because if they're not workspaces, they're more likely to be creating that gravitational pull to bring people into our physical environments. Because the trick with beta work is the more we specifically design spaces that we think are for beta work and tell people they are for beta work, it will be directly proportional to the lack of innovation that occurs within them. That's not the trick here. The trick is to actually thinking about slow lane, thinking about beta work are spaces that are not designed for work. That's how we rebalance the workplace. So to draw this to a close, because I'd love to hear your questions, um, when we think about our future, and if we can get this right, if we can rebalance work, if we can create that awareness, create those different conversations with a deeper understanding of what work means, which then leads us to really think about the way that we rebalance our physical workplace, I think we will solve a lot of those problems that I tabled earlier in the conversation. I think organisations will be more productive because alpha work will happen in, in, you know, we will recognize what it needs to, to for alpha work to occur and we'll make that possible. So there will be more productivity. Beta work is going to occur as well. So we will have more innovation. We'll enjoy the workplaces we create and that we live and work within and they will be better utilized. They may be smaller, 
but they will be they will be more uh, effectively designed to meet the challenges of both alpha and beta work. We will therefore produce less waste, less empty space, um, less emissions, less energy consumption. We're definitely going to have better conversations at work and about work. And we're going to avoid all of this sort of temptation to think that this is all about control. We can release the conversations from the obsession with control because it's counterproductive and it's actually mitigating against our rebalancing of work in the workplace. People, if they're recognized and rewarded for their beta work as well as their alpha work, they will feel more valued. We are creating, Simone, a more human workplace. Um, and in terms of our work-life balance, that's only going to improve because we will have, uh, because if we are recognized and valued at work, we will feel more positive about it. Um, we will certainly, in terms of the time we spend at our office and the time we spend away from our office, value the decisions that we've taken and the reasons why we're spending time in the office and why we're spending time away from it. This won't just become a game of how much time can I avoid being in the office. We will see the value of being there as much as seeing the value of not being there. So in reality, this, this, this particular triangle is, a, is an age-old triangle. This has been around for a long time and it's still here and it's still valid and it's still viable. This is people and place and technology in perfect harmony as it's always been, but even more so. And as usual, to create this future, it's up to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Well, I've got to see how we can get through these questions because there's a lot of them. And I will share with you, Neil, the chat afterwards because I think you'll find that as enlightening as the questions as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, very much. Bear with me a second. Let's see if we can turn my video on and get that spooky thing to start off with. There we go. Great. I'm going to start off with go right to beginning some of the questions that related to some earlier parts of your talk. Uh, this weekly occupancy pattern was the same before the pandemic. Is it more extreme now, or are we just more aware of it? Uh, I think both. I think we're, we're we're looking for it because we've you know we've we've seen it happen. We're looking for data to prove it. I think all the data I've seen and and I know there are others out there collecting a lot more data perhaps than I am on it. But we we are seeing in particular Mondays that used to be you know Friday was always a day where where occupancy tailed off. That we understood that <laughs> usually about sort of half. But we're seeing that half now being down to about sort of 10 to 20 percent on a Friday. And we're seeing Mondays getting fairly close to that in some instances. I have, I have talked to some organizations recently where Monday has started to pick up a little bit. Um, but essentially, um, what we are seeing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday as being the, the main days that people are present. Great. Thank you. Um, you differentiated reliance and trust. Joseph's asking, can you say more about the difference between those two uh firstly can i say great spot um, that was in there see if anyone recognized that um i it, it's it's a difficult one to explain but i think if alpha work is incredibly well organized and i think if our processes are robust and our technology is effective i would argue that trust isn't always completely necessary because as long as we can rely on what someone else is doing that they will fulfill their part in in that process because they know very clearly what they're doing, then we don't necessarily need the quality of trust to be associated with that. What we do need is reliability. Now, instead of continuing needing uh, beta work to come out of alpha work, can't there be a new role for specific people to float between parts of the business and drive those beta ideas? And there was lots of observations actually about the difference between beta workers and alpha workers, but then someone highlighted that you're talking about beta work and alpha work. Is that, anyway, observations around that, Neil, those kind of comments? Yeah, I'm not talking about beta workers and alpha workers, because I think we all do both to a degree, and I would encourage all of us to do both and spend time doing both, um, which requires you know everyone to recognize that beta work is not necessarily ticking things off a list and doing things efficiently is quite inefficient. I think the difficulty with creating a new role for beta work is that it's got to be driven by curiosity. Um, it's, there's got to be something that motivates us to want to explore it and to want to continue. And sometimes to want to continue against all the odds. There will be obstacles in our way. There'll be things that people try and chuck in front of us that will stop us doing this. 
It might even purely and simply be the pressure of alpha work is so great because the role has been badly designed or people have left the business and we're having to pick up slack that, that, that continually gets in the way of us doing this beta work and pursuing these, these paths of curiosity. But to make someone responsible for being curious, I think, is, is, is probably destined to failure. So I think it's, it's about stimulating the, cre the, the curiosity in everyone and recognising that beta work needs to take place and giving people the time and scope to do that beta work um, rather than assigning the specific roles. I think once we start assigning roles, we're just back into the realms of alpha work for everyone again. Thank you. Uh, how do you convince people that the slow lane is valuable? People generally feel they don't have enough time and hurry to do things and they don't understand the slow lane could have va added value. Um, I think we have to change the conversation. So I think we have to, we have to discover what the slow lane is producing. Um, I think what's interesting, and I'll use the sort of coffee analogy again. Um, if we think about, do we provide a barista service in the office or not? Even if it's a small office, is it is it going to add any value? All we'll look at is the cost. Oh, a barista service, and I've got to employ someone, it's going to cost a lot of money, I've got to buy a certain machine, and, you know, and what happens is everyone's sick. We probably need two baristas just to provide one barista service. Well, actually... You know, we'll only ever make that decision on a cost basis. We don't know how to quality, qualif qualify the value that a barista service might bring because it creates a slow lane and it creates conversation unless we actually set out to capture those stories and capture somehow the benefit of that. And I've just finished working with a client where with their new workplace, I went out on a limb and told them to buy this really expensive coffee machine. But I knew that it works in a previous client because they did all the research. So I said, look, you know, they had fantastic success with this. Um, and what was quite interesting was I was under quite a lot of pressure. I had that sort of knowing look in the project meetings, like, you know, you're spending, you're telling us to spend a lot of money on a coffee machine. But in the first week, I already had a number of stories told and fed back to me personally about conversations that took place at that coffee machine because you had to spend some time making your drink um, that would otherwise not have taken place. And so in the post occupancy work we're going to do, we're going to very much focus on that type of outcome rather than, you know, do you like the color of the office? Do you like the desk? It's all about, you know, what, what, who have you met since you've been in this place? What conversations have taken place? Have conversations taken place in this workplace that would otherwise not have taken place had you not been here? And so, you know, again, it's another issue with the whole workplace industry is we only ever look at the workplace in terms of its performance of itself. We don't ever look at the contribution that the workplace is making to the organization. Now, we have to look at that contribution because that's how we justify creating the asset in the first place, but we don't. Is it being well utilized? Are we satisfied with it? That's what we look at all the time. Well, we can have a workplace that we all absolutely love and we're really happy with it and it's really well used, but it could be doing nothing at all for the organization because of the way we've designed it, but people might still tick the right boxes when we, when we, when we do those studies. So we do have to look at the contribution it's making. So we do, as an industry, have to learn to capture stories and capture data, different data in different ways than the way we're used to. And that will help us to understand the value that beta work is delivering and the value of the spaces that we're creating that will stimulate and enable beta work. Great, thank you. A couple of people have asked the same question. Uh, Lisa's asking, what's your idea of a space for beta work? What does it feel like and look like? And Catherine's asked, what are some of the design elements for the workplace that support beta work? Um, as I said in the presentation, I, I, they're not work settings. And, and I think if we keep thinking that we design collaborative work settings and we take out the desks and we put in different types of spaces where we can all gather around a screen and uh, et cetera, then they're just coordination and cooperation settings. They're not collaboration settings. Collaboration settings, those that will stimulate and enable beta work are not work settings. And we have to stop talking about them as work settings. But there still have to be enough settings for alpha work to take place in order to make people come to the workplace because they will still seek out and land in those alpha work settings. Actually, when you look at it, the balance was probably about right pre-COVID. We used to look at that rough balance of around 50-50. I've seen it sort of shifting a little bit, 60% towards, you know, cooperation settings and 40% um, towards sort of, you know, working at a desk type settings. 
but realistically, you know, it's still a fairly similar balance. But the real difference is that those settings like cafes, which, which, and again, we should stop, sort of, stop dispersing them. I've been, I was looking at a, a workspace the other day where it was really curious because this particular workspace had all the right ingredients. If you looked at the sort of the typical uh, kit of parts, they were all there, but but the workspace wasn't working at all. And my conclusion from it was that they had they had distributed those social spaces, which were where you got drinks and where you could sit at different sort of non-work type of spaces. And there were two floors in this building, and they created three of these on each floor in the different sort of corners. And yet, because they hadn't aggregated them all and created a space that would be this sort of gravitational force in the space, they were just they would they just built the fast lane, and there was no slow lane. So we have to get out of the habit of thinking of them as part of our palette of work settings. They're not they're not work settings at all. Um, their leisure settings, and I think you know that's where we explore relationships. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't. If we if we sort of first meet someone, we think, oh, that's, that might be sort of quite a good idea. Should we talk about it a little bit more? We don't book a meeting room to go and do that. Whoever says, hey, you know, that's great. You know, we should book a room sometime and talk about this some more. They don't. They say, let's go and get a coffee. You know, so actually. Just making sure two things happen. One is stop calling them work settings. Don't design them for work. Design them for non-work activities and bring them all together. You're better off in a workplace with one space that will have enough gravitational pull than you are lots of different little spaces that will ensure that people never, ever speak to each other. Okay, one last question. What part does the human behavior play? And also, are there, is there a need for guidelines? Or guardrails, you know, is it is it a free for all? Um, I think if we start to change the conversation, um, then we will. It will start to make sense for us. Um, <clears throat> I'm never one in favour of rules. Um, you know, I never do etiquette protocol workshops. Can't stand them. Haven't been, haven't done them for years. I just work on the basis of being a good neighbour. Um, because we instinctively know what these things mean. I, th I think the I think the sort of human instinct is there. I think we just have to encourage it and we have to curate it. Um, but I don't think it's about guidelines and you know you must spend X time doing beta work and you know you will be you will be sort of you know appraised on your beta work. Oh dear, you know, let's have a look at your year's performance. You haven't done enough beta work this year. I mean that's I think that's where we start to just we start to talk about the same. We started to talk in the same language as alpha work, so it's a different, it's a different lexicon, it's a different language, it's a different conversation. But we do need this awareness that all work is not the same, and even starting at that point, most of how this presentation came together came through a chance conversation at a client premises. I just started working with them. I met with one of their senior managers who literally said to me. Do you know, I've got this team meeting and I want to encourage my people to come in more because I know, instinctively know we work better when we're together and there's more access to other people in the organisation, but I just don't know how to how to say it. You know, and I and I I basically explained in in a very simple fashion what I've just explained today, um, which is where I had this sort of massive penny drop and I sort of rushed rushed home to write lots of notes and think, oh, there's something in this. I've just realised what's going on here. Um, but he reported a much more successful conversation with his team than he'd ever had before that by just describing the different types of work and the importance of doing both and that you know he wasn't trying to bring people in just so that he could see that they were working and just so that he could have visibility of them and i do think that conversation is really destructive and i think it's time not, not that we move away from it by saying let's not talk about this anymore but we move away from it by talking about something much more interesting Great, and I just wanted to pick up on what someone's saying is is about the leaders modelling behaviour that they are expecting as well, and I think that that's it's, it goes back to that that you know the technology, the people, yep. you know, the leadership have got to be there doing this and stuff as well. Absolutely, and I think changing the conversation starts with leadership every time. Always does. But I mean, there's nothing to stop us starting at all levels within the organisation. But we can't expect that this is all going to trickle upwards. You know, this is, this has got to be a, a, a whole organisation conversation. Neil, as ever, thank you very much for a fantastic session. We've slightly gone over. Apologies to everyone who's got to rush and get into the fast lane and go on to their next meeting. <laughs> and yeah. others do enjoy being in the slow lane and go and chat to someone at the coffee machine. As you leave today, there will be uh, a link 
you'll be taken to a website just to give us some feedback. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone for your input. I am going to share that chat, chat with Neil, because Neil, I think you'll find the observations as interesting as the questions. Uh, and as I say, applause coming on the left and also on the right. Thank you very much. And thank, enjoy thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone. Alpha work is calling for me too. But um, thanks. Uh, look forward to continuing the conversation and to reading your comments. But uh, thanks for listening. Great. Thank you.